Geher tobi hamo la lastečki a goldeni. Vozizing to i na grinem val. Oj, kim si mir, man si ser solvejčiku. Her nora, vzir gej dire zubnbal. Oj, fin der vatnic, obir der er dan benkeniš. Oj, in dajn did, vo si hoptej, ki fegi der ken. Dan šen zingen, tik ver štak der barenen. A punem obehadih, Welcome, Michael Alpert, to uh, summer concerts in the White Stork Synagogue. Uh, it is supposed to be live, but because of the world situation now, we are doing this uh, digitally. And it's a, a great pleasure for me and for our audience to be listening to you, uh, telling your story and sharing it with us. Uh, Welcome. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom, Aleichem Shalom, dear Aleichem Shalom Aleman. It's wonderful to be back in the White Stork Synagogue, uh, especially being in the White Stork Synagogue and being in my garden in Scotland. Um, exactly. And, and we are live. I mean, you, you know, Kinahara, you're live. I'm live. I'm in a beautiful garden with birds and flowers. Exactly. And because you're not in the United States, you're in Scotland, you're in Europe. Yes, uh, I've lived in Scotland for the last seven years, actually. Oh, and because, uh, you know, wh whenever you read about you, it's all about America. But you've been very linked to Europe, uh, uh, also in your later career and uh, your work and everything. So for, for us, it's very interesting uh, because there are not so many authentic Yiddish singers around. And... Uh, uh, so it's a great pleasure for us to hear your story, uh, your authentic story uh, about being a Yiddish singer, a klezmer, uh, promoting uh, this Jewish culture uh, that in kind of in Europe uh, we are now in search of uh, after so many years of having kind of lost it. So uh, um, I think it would be very interesting to hear how you started you you started in los angeles but that you spoke yiddish in los angeles at home yes um it's funny how <clears throat> pardon me one second <clears throat> it's always interesting to me that people are surprised that i spoke yiddish in los angeles or even you know people often have asked me are there jews in los angeles and los angeles is actually um pretty much the third largest Jewish community in the world. Um, it wasn't as big when I was growing up, but it was big. Um, you know, it, it is a major world city and a major uh, U.S. city. Um, yes, and my, uh, it's interesting because uh, my father came from Europe, from Lithuania, essentially from, uh, we could also say from Poland, because uh, he and my whole family uh, came from Vilenszczyzna, but uh, actually the part of it, it, this was before the First World War, just before the First World War, he came to the U.S. in 1912, and um, they came to first to New England, to Boston, and then my father went on after the Second World War to Los Angeles. My mother was actually born in Boston, but her, uh, her parents had just come uh, to the U.S., uh, from the, the Bukovina region and from East Galicia, Galicia Wschodnia. And, uh, and my mother had gone to Los Angeles as a child in 1919, which was very early to go uh, out West. So interestingly, I was born in this very far place on a beautiful coast with beautiful mountains around it and, and flowers and palm trees and uh, the uh, unfortunately at that time lots of smog too I also learned English at home but but my parents especially with my father's family being Lithuanian Jews and the same is true with my mother's family being being Austro-Hungarian Jews there was this interesting situation of what linguists call heteroglossia, in other words, speaking many languages at the same time. Uh, and so Yiddish was certainly 
native to me, um, also Russian and Polish to a certain extent, um, some Ukrainian, some German because of my mother's mother, my grandmother, uh, who was from Chernivitz actually. And uh, this amazing mixture is, has a great deal to do with everything I've become and done in my life. Um, it, it's very interesting because you live in Los Angeles, you know, for Europeans, Los Angeles, it's like, you know, Hollywood and all that. And then you're talking about all these languages that you grew up with. And I know also from uh, um, having learned also that Ladino also was very active in Los Angeles. So actually as a Jewish center, uh, you were on many crossroads there in Los Angeles. Ab absolutely. No, Los Angeles is a world city. And uh, it's speaking of Hollywood, I was actually born right underneath the famous Hollywood sign. Um, literally, my, the hospital I was born in is right down the hill. And my parents lived up in the hills there when I was born in a little apartment that was right underneath this big famous Hollywood sign. So people often ask me astrologically what sign I was born under. I say the Hollywood sign. So the, uh, but one important thing I was going to say is that um, what's also so important to who I am and, and what I've done in life, the fact that not only were my parents considerably older, but my grandparents were even much older still. Um, my father's parents, I never met, even though they came to the United States. Um, if you can believe it, my, uh, my grandparents on my father's side were born in 1864 and 1868. So there are these huge bridges of time and experience and culture that, you know, somehow have um, connected. So your parents must have been very old when you were born. You yes, were... my dad was 47 and my mother was 45. And uh, I'm, I'm an only child so, still. Oh, really? <laughs> ah, <laughs> that is beautiful. So, so you, you, and then you traveled into the world, like you came to New York because uh, I have a surprise for you. Uh, you know, I also have lived several times, places in my life. And uh, there are certain things that follow me. It's like, my recordings and my books. And uh, look what I found this morning. Aha, uh -huh. yep. <laughs> that was the uh, beginning of the New York period. <laughs> so when did you come to New York? I came to New York in uh, 1979 um, and it was never my dream to go to New York. I thought I was um, basically headed for uh, going back to the land and living out in the, in the forest in Northern California or up in Vermont. Um, but uh, I had actually spent an important part of my uh, growing up years, uh, my teenage years, in, in Boston, um, I had moved, when I was 12, I moved back to Boston. So I'm a classic uh, bi-coastal in that sense. I grew up, you know, my primal memories are, of, are, are and my, early, my childhood is the West Coast and California, Southern California. Um, my teenage years were in New England, um, which was where most of my family was and my real strongly Yiddish speaking family and traditional Jewish, uh, ranging from Frum to traditional. And so that was an important thing too. Then I went back to California for five years and I went to UCLA uh, in the, uh, basically 1974 to about 1979. But in 1979, I came to New York, um, never, as I said, never having dreamed of going to New York, but I had, uh, both, I had a partner in New York and then I had an offer of a job playing Jewish music in New York City. And it was really the beginnings, we had start, started the, what was to grow into the whole klezmer revitalization and the Yiddish Renaissance and so forth um, in the late 1970s um, in LA actually. Before Capella, there was another, we had another band called uh, the Chutzpah Yiddish Orchestra in Los Angeles. And, uh, but then in 1979, I moved to New York and the whole kind of uh, modern period of my life, more adult part of my life 
began. Because even in New York, uh, uh, I mean, Yiddish and the Yiddish theater was kind of down at that period. It was not, you know, so uh, I know this whole revival, it was also some in Germany, but, you know, it started in the States, maybe before in the States or simultaneously. But it was not very uh, obvious for anybody to sing Yiddish songs or, or deal with Yiddish uh, uh, culture. Uh, because uh, uh, I don't know with the American Jews, but they were probably also more focused on singing new Hebrew songs or old Hebrew songs than singing Yiddish uh, traditional songs. Yes. I mean, that's on the one hand, that's true, um, even in New York. And, you know, it used to be when we first started, uh, when we formed Capella and we were performing in, uh, in and around New York, but not only New York, we began uh, traveling and touring, uh, not necessarily nationwide so early, but uh, in, the thing was that in those days when you did anything, that, if you had the word Yiddish attached to something, it was mainly 60, 70, 80 year old people who would show up. Um, it's not that there was no Yiddish. There, of course, in the New York, just in the New York area, there were um, possibly millions of people that spoke Yiddish um, or at least knew Yiddish. And, but absolutely Yiddish culture didn't have the, you know, the popular or, and certainly, you know, international focus and consciousness that, that it has today. And it um, was through the music. I mean, the, uh, the, that the music started to be interesting for young people. That was something new and not necessarily Orthodox uh, Jews, but for uh, a larger audience. Yeah, specifically for, you know, not for Orthodox Jews. I mean, Orthodox Jews already, you know, had a great deal of culture left, especially the Hasidic world, which in the Hasidic world of 1979, 80 was, of course, even then was kind of different than the Hasidic world of today. But um, yes, and, uh, you know, a number of us have really described this Yiddish and Klezmer Yiddish music revitalization, Yiddish cultural revitalization as a countercultural phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, for most of the of us younger musicians who were involved in it, this was going back to our grandparents' generation. In the case of a few of us, myself, Henry Sapoznik, Josh Woletsky, and so forth, it was our parents' generation. It was, our, you know, our parents were in in a few cases, immigrants. And um, we had a different connection, of course, to Yiddish language and therefore the songs and the, the, the song tradition than many people, even at the time who were involved in it. And of course, differently than many younger people today. In the beginning in the States, uh, did, uh, did a lot of people come to the concerts? Was it difficult to arrange concerts? No, not at all. That's, see, that was the thing is that um, just looking at Capella, for example, m me, Henry Sapoznik, Lauren Brody, who was also part of Cap Capella, we were involved in different kinds of traditional music, of ethnic music, of folk music, American folk music. Um, I had lived in Yugoslavia for a couple of years as a late teenager. So I was very involved in the music of the Balkans. And I had grown up with, as I said, some with Russian and, and Ukrainian and Polish. And a lot of that music was um, very, very familiar to us. Um, but so the interesting thing is, you know, we were used to making no money playing music. Um, you'd play a, a folk club or something like that or and maybe make $35. Um, the first concert that Capella did which was in Providence, Rhode Island, in a synagogue. Um, suddenly, we made two hundred dollars a piece, and you know, all of a sudden, it was the, you know these were concerts where people were sitting and listening and and tuned into, and you know, it was a, a brand new phenomenon, uh, but one that was increasingly better and better received. And within a year or two, we were playing uh, events like the Philadelphia Folk Festival and um, large venues for, you know, where you saw that um, 
klezmer music and Yiddish music, which I preferred to call it uh, at the time and still do, um, was being accepted as a, a part of the uh, rainbow of, of, of folk musics and traditional musics in the, you know, this diverse American context. It's interesting because at the same time uh, the music became popular, the Yiddish theater wasn't really uh, uh, having any real future. It became very marginalized. While the Yiddish music and the songs, they could kind of uh, carry on and even for people who not necessarily understood the songs. Ah, by the way, it's interesting for me uh, how, I mean, because you, you are a Yiddish singer and uh, you sing for in Yiddish and uh, usually your audience, they don't understand what you're singing about. And uh, the Yiddish words are so extremely important. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, in within this world, the world of the Yiddish cultural world, I mean, what we now speak of as Yiddishland, yeah. um, the comprehension of Yiddish, I mean, all kinds of younger people are, you know, have learned Yiddish, are learning Yiddish or at various stages. Uh, people who, you know, were not just interested in the language per se or the songs, even people who are, you know, very fine klezmer musicians, but have realized uh, over the years that, you know, in order to really be part of this culture, they need to know Yiddish. And um, an old uh, close friend and kind of mentor of mine, Ben Basler, Basiler, Berek Basiler, who was a klezmer musician from Warsaw, uh, he said years ago to some of my colleagues in, uh, in early Brave Old World, he said, uh, <laughs> if you want to be a klezmer, you have to speak Yiddish. So um, I, that's really taken off. Um, the other interesting part of that phenomenon and actually of this whole phenomenon was the development of the interest in Yiddish music and Yiddish culture in Germany. And um, I first went there. Uh, we went with Capella in 1984. We did our first tour of Europe, and we were the first American uh, neo klezmer band to go and tour in Europe. The summer of 1984, and the the remarkable thing about Germany, not so surprising, was that all of a sudden our audiences, who were almost completely non-Jewish, um, suddenly understood you know, 80% of what we were saying when we spoke Yiddish, I made a point of speaking Yiddish from the stage and, uh, you know, tweaking it a little bit to, you know, when I knew uh, people didn't understand the Hebrew words or the Slavic words. And, uh, but uh, far more than uh, most audiences in America, especially younger audiences, um, people, there was this uh, language and, and communication avenue that was open there um, in addition to all of the historical and and social factors that made Yiddish fascinating to people and, and the Yiddish world and, and yes, all of and that. It was, uh, it was I mean people were hungry for this culture. You felt Absolutely that. yeah mm -hmm. and if I can skip to performing in Poland for the first time which was 1991 Mm -hmm. um, not the first time I'd been in Poland. I'd been in Poland in 1974 when I was 20 years old. And that's a whole other little interesting <laughs> chapter. But uh, one big difference playing in Poland, we, we performed basically at the, one of the very early uh, Jewish culture festivals in Kraków um, in June of uh, 1991. And the thing in Poland was that even if people didn't understand the language, they understood the music. The music was natural in a certain way. And, and what was clear when we were playing on the stage there in the street in Krakow, you know, and there were uh, you know, a few hundred people, not the thousands of people, uh, but a large crowd. Um, the way I always used to describe it is people, when they heard this music, they knew how to dance in a circle. <laughs> they got into a circle, 
and they danced, you know, and not wildly, but, you know, uh, in, in those years in Poland, I think, you know, and I began teaching dance, Yiddish dance there in 1994. Um, so many people had, were familiar with the kind of, the kind, with, I think, traditional East European music, traditional Polish music, traditional Polish dancing. Lots of people had been in dance groups, which of course, um, were encouraged um, in the years of, of communist Poland. And they knew how to dance to this stuff uh, in one way or another. They, you know, they knew something very similar or, you know, we were really kind of, in that sense, we were finally home again. Um, and in a way through, uh, through the music, because you're talking about Germany, they understand more the Yiddish, but in Poland, it's almost like uh, uh, the music, the sounds uh, uh, is a kind of a relief for emotions that are kept inside because uh, they, because also the history with communism and everything was just uh, completely uh, uh, was not allowed or was not really dealt with for so many years, the history uh, of the Jews in Poland. So we yes. do playing this very joyful sort of music and and also it's or dancing it's kind of a I was an outlet of emotions and, and absolutely yeah but but again the the you know even even in spite of government policy um the social and cultural sensibility sense of both the Jewish heritage and our common heritage was so strong i mean and it, not only on a on an intellectual level but just like i said people got it people understood it. the cultural understanding was so much deeper and of course you know we were in the place where we uh in in broad terms um came from culturally literally um Henry's parents were from Poland. My father was, from, and my whole family was from a, a corner of Poland. Uh, the, you know. It, so tell it, me, so from '91, you started to perform in the in the festival in Krakow, and you've also you've also been very involved in the programming and and uh, coming every year for that festival. Uh, uh, how you, you know, and you probably still, you probably still are. And uh, how has it affected you and your musicians from the United States coming here to Europe? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? Okay, well, well, of course, let's, you know, keep, remember that, you know, we started coming to Europe and then not only Capella, but then Brave Old World and the Klesmatics, but, you know, now you many, it? many people. I, mean, I was gonna in, in many different bands. I mean, uh, uh, Brave Old World, which is so famous, and also this uh, Itzhak Perlman uh, CD that became so important because it was also bringing the music to many people who never uh, would have been confronted with Yiddish and Klezmer having Itzhak Perlman playing. And I know you were the producer there and <laughs> had a big hand uh, of that recording. So I'm not forgetting that. I just think that uh, for us also, it's very interesting how you, and you felt it was so important to be involved in here in Poland and this revival of, of the Yiddish and the Klezmer in Poland. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's the, you know, that's, that's the important thing is that, um, well, first I was going to say, it, you know, it's not an, it's no longer a new phenomenon that, you know, we've been coming from the U.S. or from other parts of, you know, Western Europe, but especially from North America, musicians coming to perform and teach uh, Yiddish music and other traditions in uh, in Poland or, or in Europe in general. That's been going on for, you know, 30 years now. Uh, we're actually 35. But the, yeah, the importance of Poland, and I guess this is where I come in or where, where it connects with me personally is that out of the entire scene, I was pretty much the only person who was, at least it was active in klezmer bands, who spoke Polish, um, was connected to Poland in that way, even though uh, there were other people, um, uh, a couple, as I mentioned, Henry Sapozny, whose parents had grown up in interwar Poland. Um, 
But, you know, I was the one that spoke Polish, was, had been involved with lots of different non-Jewish European, East European musics. And uh, it just was a natural fit for me. And uh, mm. then my personal friendship with uh, Janusz Makuch and at the beginning Krzysztof Gerat, who were directing the Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow. And um, it, it was in many ways a kind of, of coming home or getting to visit, you know, an old home that, uh, you know, and, and of course the, our relationship with Poland is more complex than that. It wasn't just kind of sweetness and light and, oh, I'm home, it's so great. Um, I have many homes. Uh, you know, cause people have often asked me, oh, you know, you don't seem to live much of anywhere. And I'm like, no, I lived 35 years in New York City. I am very rooted all of the places I come from. I'm Californian, I'm a New Englander. I'm not a New Yorker, even though I lived there all these years. I'm very connected to Europe, especially Eastern Europe. And now I live in a village on the coast of Scotland. And all of these places are my homes and, and the whole picture that they create um, are you know, my it, home in the world. Uh, yes, and uh, you don't feel uh, that it makes you uprooted uh, being in so many different places or does it make just, you know, your personality, uh, 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 enlarging your yourself in a way. Uh, no, it makes me feel more rooted because I feel like, you know, I'm, it's like a tree that has roots that go out very, very far. My roots extend to many different places and they, and they, you know, like, just like a, the network of roots of a tree, they connect all these places. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, Michael, people today, they're so afraid of uh, losing their identity all the time, people talking about losing their identity, uh, but uh, being rooted, but also to link with others. Uh, it's, uh, it's always been like that. Uh, it's part of our culture. And, and now you, you also do things with the Ukrainians. You have uh, uh, also a new, quite new album with uh, an, a Ukrainian singer where you mix. Yeah, I, well, actually, again, not so new because the, uh, I mean, it came out, that, that album came out in 2015, but that's a project that we've been doing together since 1994. So it's, you know, itself is, you know, over 25 years old at this no. point. But yeah, that, that of course is a very dear thing to my heart too, that exploration of common Ukrainian and Ukrainian Jewish identity. Because of course my, you know, my, my, my mother's family was from Western Ukraine. And, and uh, it's not only about the literal kind of family genetic connection, but again, the cultural sensibilities, the, the cultural memory, um, coming both from the Jewish perspective and the Ukrainian perspective are so strong. I mean, it was as I began really uh, getting to know people in the Ukrainian communities, uh, Ukrainian American, Ukrainian Canadian communities, we we're all from the same place. It's like, you know, oh, my parents are from Zhitomir. My parents are from Zhitomir also. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, you know, and the food, so much of our food is the same, that, you know, the same thing coming to Poland for so many North American Jews. It's like, you know, oh, it's Jewish food. Uh, you know, may have a few different things in it, but uh, the- Absolutely, you know, it's yeah. important to, to get this uh, also for us Europeans, because, you know, uh, um, uh, people love to say the others, you, what are you doing, the others, and, uh, you know, to separate and to make such separations. But it's very difficult to make such separations. Uh, and I think uh, being a Jew, you have a, another perspective, a possibility to, to open up and to, to reach out. And uh, I think you do it wonderfully uh, with your music and, and song. And Yiddish in a way is that way. The language is built that way with so many a languages within the language. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, you know, mezokta velt with veltalach, you know, yeah. a world full of little worlds. No, I, I, that's so true. You know, I like rather than, you know, what are you doing? I, you know, I think both of us prefer to say, you know, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are in this world together um, and, and in, in these societies together. And 
just like similarly similar to the United States and if I dare say to uh, to Israel in some ways but it but to so many societies, you know, societies are, are most of them are not uh, historically monocultural. Um, Absolutely. I think uh, the music uh, has, uh, you know, meant a lot. We're talking now about Poland. I mean, it has meant a lot after 1989. Uh, we're talking about free Poland, uh, that uh, meeting with these different cultures that uh, 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 it has meant a lot to the people here. Uh, and uh, they love it. It's al it always uh, already become an integral part of uh, the cultural scene in 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 Poland and maybe uh, other countries too. But I can you know here I'm sure uh, people are waiting for the concerts in the synagogue. Uh, there are many people organizing it, and uh, um, most of the concerts are, have Jewish. Uh, um, music and it's always packed always interested and i know that if we had a concert with you it would be packed and we cannot let in very many people now uh, and mm. uh, so uh, the hope for the summary and also we can only do with local musicians um so uh, uh, it's very different than um the possibilities of course but this all will change soon and we will be able to invite you and uh, you will come uh, with your whoever you want to come with and uh, i'm sure it's going to be a full house and uh, it's very nice to talk with you michael and uh, and thank you for sharing your story and uh amen amen alibi yes here in Wroclaw and stay healthy and good luck with all you're up to and uh, uh, yes next year I hope to see you here in Wroclaw yes amen and you know a great pleasure to talk with you too thank you for for this you know, opportunity to talk and uh and, and let us talk more in general. Yes. <laughs> let us all talk more. But, but right now, let's you and I talk more too. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Papa, Zeit gesund. Alle, do vizenja. Geher tobi hamo, la lastechke, a goldene. Vozizing to inagrinem val. Oi kim si mir man si ser solvejiku her nora usirgei dires ubal oi finder vaten o bir der er dein benkenis oi in dein dit was ich hob dei gefegiderken dann schen singen dit mer stark der barenen apunem abergadich Schön sehr, ihr Landereken.